afternoon, members. We'll call this meeting of the Education Finance Committee to order. The first order of business is House File 2127, the Representative Myra Bill. And Representative Myra moves that House File 2127 be recommended to pass and referred to the General Register. Representative Meyer, my understanding is you have two amendments, the A1 and A4 amendments? Yes, I do. All right, Thank so you, Mr. Chair. Representative Meyer moves the A1 amendment. Did you have an oral amendment to this amendment? Yes, I do. I'd like to incorporate it. Okay, what is that amendment, Representative Meyer? Uh, that is changing uh, the phrase digital curriculum on line 418 to technology. Okay, so on line 418, changing digital to technology. Digital curriculum to technology. Digital curriculum to technology. Does staff get that? Yes. Okay. And so we will incorporate that into the A1 amendment. And this is to get the bill in the form the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion prevails. Representative Meyer, you also have the A4 amendment. Uh, no amendment on that one, correct? Correct. And this is, again, to get the bill in the form that the author would like. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion prevails. Representative Meyer, my understanding is that this is the bill is now in the format you would like, and that the 2127 bill was uh, discussed pretty extensively in policy. Uh, any financial considerations you want the committee to be aware of? I see we, we do have a fiscal note in the amount of uh, $208,000 for fiscal year 13. Uh, the, but I think uh, your amendment took care of those concerns. It did. All right. Anything else you'd like to say about your bill? No, I would appreciate your support. All right. Any for, this is a public hearing. Are there members of the public which testify in favor or voice concerns about the bill? Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public comment portion of this bill. Any questions or discussion from members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion prevails. House file 212727 has passed and is sent to the General Register. Representative Myra, we thank you for your thank you. concise and abbreviated uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, the next bill on the agenda is House File 329, Representative Bills. If you could go up to the table. While we're doing that, uh, Representative Erickson moves approval of the minutes from the February 16th meeting. Is there any corrections or additions or discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. All right. Uh, Representative Bills moves that House File 329 be recommended to pass and referred to the General Register. Representative Bills, my understanding is that you have an amendment as well. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, move the DE2 amendment. Representative Bills moves the DE2 amendment. With Do you members have a copy of the DE2 amendment in their packets? Mr. Chair. Representative Dryland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to object to um, that last bill rushing out so fast. There are seven days on the Hill here uh, today, or at least that seemed to be on my calendar. There's probably more than that. And, um, you know, three minutes in to do a, a bill that some are very interested in, um, I would I object to that kind of speed being good government. <coughs> Uh, Representative Greiling, we um, we did open it up for uh, testimony from the public as well, um, so it wasn't uh, it was certainly was a brief presentation, but we did not uh, we opened it up for testimony from the public, and there was no members of the public who testified either in favor of or voiced concerns with the bill. So, um, well, I, I don't know how we could have behaved differently other than to start the committee late. We don't, and the, the tradition of this committee is we start on time, Representative Brown. And, Mr. Chair, I, I definitely support that tradition, but, um, <laughs> but to let some minority members actually get in their chairs before passing it, I think would, would help greatly with the floor discussion. Well, Representative Grantland, we did have members of both parties in the hearing, but I, I appreciate that. And if we need to, if we need to start a committee later or re um, do that to make sure we have more members of the minority party here, then we can talk about that. But, well, Representative Grantland, Mr. Chair, I don't mean to start later. I think you should always start on time. And uh, but I think to actually take a vote and move a bill to the floor without uh, yeah, three minutes after the committee starts is um, excessive speed and excessive speed usually means that later you're going to take a lot more time and I think that time of working things out 
should be done in this committee, not on the floor. If I were Representative Myra, I would prefer to have things asked about and, and decided and worked out um, in this committee and not be open to um, unsuspecting things that might have been fixed in this committee. Thank you, Representative Grabbing. I appreciate you sharing that with me. And if uh, we have uh, three bills on the agenda today, and uh, maybe you and I can discuss offline that maybe we, we should uh, we'll consider having the committee come back. If, if, we, if we wrap up everything on time, we can uh, talk about the issue more at the end of the committee, or maybe we could talk about coming back at 5 o'clock. Representative Grabbing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, coming back at 5 o'clock is fine with me, but maybe not with everybody. But my final question is, is, this, uh, is the mandate still in there that every – student in ninth grade take a um, an online course and if that is still in there what was the fiscal note for that for local school districts um, well, representative Greiling I'll ask uh, well I'll have that question go to representative Myra on the bill if she's ready to answer that and then uh, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda but any additional questions we'll, uh, we'll either take up later on today or we'll discuss the possibility of coming back at five and mr. Future. chair that is my final question Thank you. Uh, so representative Meyer did you hear uh, out of deference to the uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Greiling, um, yes, there is on line 2.1 through 2.5 uh, a requirement for students to take one digital course uh, in high school uh, that is effective for graduating seniors 2019. In talking to the legislative auditor and others and looking at uh, current statute, it doesn't change anything for high schools. Uh, currently, they are required to offer uh, digital courses to their students. And um, what they, they can already take those digital courses. If you look on, um, let's see, line 7.31 to 7.33. The department already develops, publishes, and maintains a list of digital providers that are already out there and um, so that students can select from those courses um, already. Oh, Mr. Chair. Representative Bryling. Uh, line 2.1 says high school students must receive at least one digital course rather than just being offered. It's the must receive that is the unfunded mandate. And that's what I think there should be a, a local fiscal impact statement um, for that. And I'm surprised that there were no, um, <laughs> no testifiers that wanted to ask about that in this committee in the audience because we've been very careful not to have um, unfunded mandates for local school districts when we aren't giving them any uh, money and so um, then they have to do one more thing with less and that's my question and I, it still will remain and I will pursue it on the floor so I would I think you might want to have that answered here with what does that cost and so forth rather than take it to the floor I would rather do that with you here than on the floor but I will do it on the floor if we don't do it here Representative Greiling, Representative Myra, we'll, uh, we'll revisit that in this committee then, either uh, later on uh, in this hearing or this evening. So Representative Bills. Uh, Representative Bills moves House File 329 be recommended to pass and refer to the General Register. And Representative Bills moves the DE2 amendment. Did you have an oral amendment to the DE2 amendment, Representative Bills? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Uh, proceed with that, please. My oral amendment would be to delete line 1.11, delete line 1.12, renumber line 1.13, change the 4 to a 3, and delete line 1.14. And that completes my oral amendment. Okay. And, uh, this is to put the bill in the form that the author would like. Representative Greiling, this is not uh, uh, this is not within 24 hours, from my understanding, as that this is done to the Peace in the Valley Amendment. So I just want to run that by you, Representative Greiling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so then I would need it repeated. Is he working off the original bill or the Delete Everything Amendment? The Delete Everything Amendment. Okay, Representative and then Bills. could you repeat what he just said? Representative Bills, could you please repeat that just to make sure that staff and all members hear that? Yes, Mr. Chair. The oral amendment would be to delete 1.11, the entire line, delete 1.12, the entire line, renumber line 1.13, 
changing the, the four to a three and delete line 1.14, the entire line. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I have it now. So the, what's still standing is number four, or what's now number four, but it's renumbered. Yes, Mr. Chair. Does that complete your oral amendment? Yes, it does, Mr. Chair. Members, all those in favor of the DE2 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion prevails. And Representative Bills, that's it with the amendments, correct? Yes, sir. To your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, House File 329 seeks to codify uh, long-standing Attorney General opinions and U.S. District Court ruling. Specifically, the bill enumerates political activities at minimum that will be prohibited uh, with public resources through district policy. House File 329 provides clarification that said policy will only pertain to employees when they are in an official capacity and performing their duties under contract. Lastly, the bill also enumerates that districts must provide factual information to the public regarding local ballot initiatives. Um, I guess you could just say the bill works to ensure that our schools are a place of learning, not politicking for any side. I have also distributed a copy of the Lakeville ISD 194 policy that, that is a yellow copy that you've had and that you can find in your packet. That was upheld by the U.S. District Court in Education Minnesota versus Lakeville School District 194 in 2004. Uh, this is one district and possibly the only district that has taken the Attorney General opinion seriously and worked to create a policy based upon it. Uh, if it would please the Chair, we could move to testimony or I, could, I would be happy to answer questions. Well, Representative Bills, uh, it's your presentation, so it looks like you have a well educated uh, staff or uh, testifier here who could enlighten us and provide additional information to the committee. So at this time, uh, would the, would the uh, testifier please introduce yourself and uh, state your name for the record? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Volk. Um, I am currently a school board member for the Lakeville School District. And I have been a school board member for um, over 10 years. As you can see from our policy, I believe it should show you that it's been in place since, um, maybe it doesn't, but in, in my copy, if you look on our website, policy A100, it shows that it's been in place since 1997. Our policy um, was created due to um, public and parent complaints that campaigning was taking place in our schools. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, you know, one of the complaints was is that we had staff members that had uh, political campaign signs actually in windows, so when um, the community was driving by, they could see, you know, who people were supporting, etc. Um, some teachers were uh, actually taping signs, etc., onto their desks. Um, the other thing that had taken place is that some of our high school students were recruited during the daytime to actually help with flyers, stuff envelopes, those types of things, activities that were taking place on behalf of um, endorsed candidates. So our policy um, was put into place, and as you can see, um, basically it covers those types of activities not taking place in the school. And as was mentioned, it has been challenged in the federal court in 2004. And basically the challenge, the promise of the challenge was to be able to have um, flyers put into the, um, the staff <laughs> mailboxes on behalf of, a, in indoor, uh, in behalf of a presidential candidate. And the district wouldn't allow it according to the policy. And that was upheld in court. And the reason it was upheld according to the judge, or at least one of the reasons, is because Lakeville had been fair and balanced in upholding this policy all along. And at this point, there wasn't any, um, he, the judge couldn't see any reason to change that. Um, there is, if you look in um, section, let's see and the procedures in section C. There is an allowance for what we call public fora. And that clause is, a, is in there if, in case, let's say a PTO were to request that they would like to have local candidates come in and maybe have a debate. 
Well, the only way that that can take place is that a special request comes to the school board and a date, a time, a building is designated. There's parameters that are put on that activity and then the school board would vote whether or not that can take place. So that's how the policy is a little balanced. It's like it, it, it helps to um, keep some of these activities not taking place during the actual school hours. During the um, last referendum that we had, our teachers union um, actually formed a vote yes committee and they adhered to the policy and uh, basically I don't think that it was a very big hindrance for them. They, everything went well for, and they were able to um, state their position. Our copy of our policy is available in all of our school buildings. It's available on our website and it's also placed in our student handbooks. Our administrators um, each and every year go into the buildings, talk about the policy, answer any questions, especially for new staff members, et cetera. And um, I guess in summation, I guess I wanted to just say that this policy has worked very well for the Lakeville School District. And um, basically we've been able to um, thrive in the business of education in our school district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Volk. Representative Bills, do you have any additional testifiers? No, I do not, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify in favor, favor or voice concerns about the bill? If so, please come forward. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Hi, Chair, members of the committee, please state your name for the record. My name is Roger Arnson. Uh, I, I uh, along with Mr. Krumquist and, and Ms. Doland, uh, Dozeland and some others, we've met with Representative Bills multiple times about this bill and, and we appreciate the amendment that he's offered here to make this work. Uh, I think that he's uh, appropriately represented to you that this tends to codify an area of law that um, has more been on the Attorney General opinion that came out some years ago. And some years ago, uh, he's been reading opinions that date back to 1927. So you have to give him some credit for the, the for the work. Has been reading opinions back to 1927. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chair, uh, we have taken a look at, at these, and I think it's important for the um, uh, members of the committee to know why this type of legislation is both appropriate um, and necessary. Um, in in the old days, the, the general legal rule was school districts could only do those things that were expressly authorized by statute. And the Attorney General's opinion says school districts were never authorized to expend political funds or resources for candidates for office, to, uh, for referendum questions, or for political purposes. And, and absent that express authorization, that activity was prohibited. And in one point, the AG actually says illegal. Um, on the other hand, there were very specific statements of what school districts could do. That changed in the 90s where the, the legislation in the general powers um, statute for school districts was added to, uh, to add implied powers and the things that furthered school districts' interest that they would have any legitimate uh, business powers to do those sorts of things. And, and that's where the line got a little bit fuzzy here and, and Representative Bill's uh, by taking this is basically going to say with this bill that school districts should adopt a policy as the one that is in a place in Lakeville um, governing these activities so it's clear and, and we think that's a good thing, Mr. Chair, and supporters bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Scott Kronquist with the Association of Metropolitan School Districts. And I, I won't be repetitive, but I do just want to go on the record thanking Representative Bills for being willing to work with us. And, and we thank with the amendments that you had just adopted uh, has addressed our concerns and we, we can support the, the bill. And thank, thank you, for Representative Bills. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify in favor or voice concerns about the bill? We'll take questions. Oh, because it's worth one of the testifiers. Yeah, we'll just have to go <clears throat> Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Mr. Chair, my name is Kirk Stein. I want to, excuse me, I'm on staff with the Minnesota School Boards Association. And, and uh, I briefly talked to Representative Bills about this issue. And I think one of the, as, as an association that represents all 340 school districts, I think this, isn't, this is one of those issues, again, that has worked for Lakeville, has worked very well for Lakeville. And there, we've had some inquiries in our office about additional adoptions of this amendment, or excuse me, of this policy. <laughs> So I think it's important to consider when, as a school board member, one way that you govern is through your policy development, the policy adoption. 
And I think that when you go through a piece that goes through an adoption policy, then you've also got to consider training of staff. You also, if you're, if you're a good school district, you'll follow through on that training to make sure it's been implemented and, and perhaps collect some data. So I think that part of the discussion, I think, is that for you guys is that is this going to be a mandate for school districts? And I would say in part it is because the other school districts who have adopted this have found that it, it works for them. Other districts, on the other hand, perhaps have not. And I think that... Uh, May not, it may not have had the same issues before them. So we're just raising that issue and uh, be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is John Kisselishan. I've been a resident of the Roseville School District for the past 26 years. I have two children in the Roseville schools. I served as mayor of the city of Roseville from 2000 to 2004. And an interesting fact here is Representative Greiling actually handed me my graduation diploma from high school back a number of years ago. <laughs> I have two handouts. Uh, one of them is one that has uh, yellow highlighted that I highlighted on there. And then the second document is titled Roseville Legislative Action Committee. I'm here to speak in favor of the bill, but I'm hoping that this could be strengthened as it goes through the process. Um, I feel that education dollars should be spent on uh, educating children, not spent on partisan political action committees. But unfortunately, though, this is being done in the Roseville School District today and has the support of the Roseville School Board. Now, in my opinion, the school district supporting a partisan political action committee should be made illegal, and frankly, it should be categorized as a crime with criminal consequences. Now, several years ago, our school board created a group called the Roseville Area Schools Legislative Action Committee, and the district has provided support staff, board support, email, website, so on and so forth, all, all supported by the taxpayers. Now, this group claims to be nonpartisan and issue-oriented, but as you can see from the letter that I received as a parent back last year, actually all the parents in the district received this letter, this letter here is about as nonpartisan as a press release from a political party. The difference is a political party is supported by private dollars. This handout here was distributed using taxpayer resources and taxpayer dollars. Now, when I filed a complaint with the school board, the response was that they violated none of their policies uh, and that these type of communications are perfectly okay. No problem with them. When I raised the question with the uh, county attorney's office, their response was that since none of the people named in this letter were technically candidates running in an election, none of the campaign finance laws and none of the laws that prohibit public employees from compelling others to campaign applied because there was no, quote, campaign going on. Now. I think the bill is a good start, and I hope it moves forward, and I hope it is adopted. But there's a couple, three points I wanted to make here. First, it appears that under this current proposal here, the school district will still be able to use taxpayer dollars to attack legislators in general, maybe just not on some particular proposal, which is how this lit piece here was done. Second, it appears that many of the prohibitions apply only to employees. Um, but it appears that maybe elected officials and volunteers may be able to continue to use school district resources or have access to district information that either the public has no access to or the public would have to pay to get access to. For example, the general public can't just walk into a school building and ask the school administrator to send out a letter using the school district's email listserv system. The Legislative Action Committee can do that, but I as a private citizen cannot. Now third, there's no penalty for violating this proposal. When a violation occurs, the board, like in my case, will simply state that it's a personnel matter, and therefore the action on any complaint is protected by data practices laws. So in other words, nothing will happen. And I would ask that maybe there be a consideration that this be considered a misdemeanor for this type of activity, or at the very least, give citizens the right to maybe file an action with the Office of Administrative Hearings. There needs to be some independent process here 
to evaluate if there is a violation of this type of activity. Um, I'll stand for questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we're going to conclude. We're, we're going to take all public testimony, and then okay. uh, members can go back and ask individual members of the public uh, questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify in favor or voice concerns with the bill? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. From Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, Jan Olsweiger, Education, Minnesota. I think that you just heard um, that this is, system is working very well in a couple of school districts and that school boards on their own can determine what those policies are. And I commend uh, Lakeville for taking the actions that they did. Sometimes there are things that happen that are inappropriate in school districts and I think the administration, the school board should do what is appropriate. And if that is the case, they may adopt a school board policy. So I see this as a mandate that is overreaching. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware, because I've testified a few times on this bill, that it is the Department of Administration's opinion, which was released publicly, that school employee email addresses are public data. So some of you may have even requested those email addresses. Certainly a number of legislators currently seated have requested the email addresses of some of our members and have sent political surveys on legislative issues to our members asking what they think. So a legislator can send an email for political purposes, that's number three on line point 1.13. Um, but now the school employee is not going to be able to respond unless the administration says it's okay. There's a reason why administration is here supporting this and that the school employees are not because if you look at line point 1.15, <laughs> they shall not be prohibited except when performing duties assigned to them under their employment contract with the district or representing their employer in an official capacity. So does that mean now that employees can speak freely if it fits with the administration's point of view? And is that really how we want to be interpreting freedom of speech. I'm not an attorney who is terribly wise on freedom of speech, but it certainly seems that the administration has a lot more say and the school employees don't unless the administration gives them the authority. And if a teacher uses their email to talk about, you know, between each other about a political purpose, um, is that a problem? And what is on line 1.13 a political purpose? So we think that there are a number of issues with this bill. We think that people can talk to them politically. Legislators ask our members what they think. But yet, I think there'd be serious question as to their ability to do it. And then I would just add, if they did it, would they be considered an ineffective teacher? <laughs> there are a number of issues related to this. I think uh, Representative Bills, I think he's got some good intentions. I think this is reaching farther. And I would encourage school boards to take the power that they already have and make school board policies that fit rather than imposing a state mandate on how they need to behave. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify in favor or voice concerns of the bill? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Matt Tobirin with SEIU, the Union of School Support Staff. Uh, first, I want to thank Representative Bills for removing lines 1.11 uh, and 1.12. I think those certainly caused the most serious concern amongst our members. Um, I, I do just want to say, we do have concerns over this bill. I do want to first say that we in no way support using public 
funds or school district resources for political purposes. And we are very clear with our members to not do that and to be very careful with how they uh, go about um, uh, conducting themselves in those matters in and outside of school. Uh, but I think our concerns are more around the implementation of this and, and sort of going to Ms. Allschwager's comments of how exactly it will be interpreted, uh, communication, and especially member member to member communication or union member communication to their fellow union members and what might or might not fall under this uh, net of political purposes. Uh, as it's been said, there are many school districts who have policies like this in place and policies that are working and we certainly support those policies um, but we would ask uh, to not uh, add an additional mandate onto school districts uh, to, to force all 340 to create these policies if they don't feel that that's something necessary for their school district at this time. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify in favor or voice concerns about the bill? Seeing none, we'll close the public portion and comment of this bill. Uh, Representative Bills, did you uh, have any comments before we went to member questions? No, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first on the list is Representative Plum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, today, in fact, I received a call during school hours from a uh, school. It, you know, it, this technology we have is great. You get to see uh, where it comes from. It was a larger school district, so it was showing up as their uh, generic number. And uh, as a freshman, I uh, remembered receiving <clears throat> frequent emails, calls, etc. And some of these during school time from staff. And I thought that was peculiar uh, that they'd be uh, utilizing, you know, the school and district resources for lobbying. And I understand why this bill is brought forward. Having been a previous school board member, I, I'm aware of the association having uh, assistance in different procedures and policies so that the effort really is minimal to put in a policy. Um, but apparently uh, that minimal effort is too much to have this as a general policy because, you know, again, uh, I repeatedly receive during school hours uh, phone calls and, uh, you know, emails from staff and quite interesting, uh, last session even received uh, a series of phone calls from students right after school uh, lobbying on behalf of one opinion of a bill. And uh, so I, I think there is a need for us to clarify that this is not a uh, appropriate practice since apparently the districts that are allowing this to happen uh, aren't taking care of it. But yeah, just uh, uh, less than two hours ago. So uh, apparently it's still going on. Thank you. Representative Plum, Representative Dabney, then Downey. Is it one o'clock yet, Mr. Chair? Yeah, it is. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. How'd I do? That's a matter of perspective, Representative. It, it certainly is. It certainly is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, a question for uh, Mr. Aronson, if you could. Mr. Aronson, if you could please come back down. Thanks. Representative Dabney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Aronson, um, I'm thinking back vaguely to last year. Uh, Chair Erickson worked with uh, your two principals associations on a framework for evaluation of principles. And it was, it was very rich and detailed and multidimensional. And part of that, as I recall, was in defining what an effect, part of the task of being an effective principal was acting in the community and actually being aware of political trends as they affected education. And I, enjoy meeting with uh, students, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of student teachers and student nurses, and I tend to think of nursing and, and teaching as very similar in terms of professional status. And one of the pieces that I always affirm on Nurses Day, the student, teach, the student nurses who come into my office, 
is that they're engaging in the political process, that part of being a professional is engaging in the political process and bringing your professional knowledge, insight, wisdom into the political process for the rest of us who aren't nurses or whatever it may be. Um, when I look at Mr. Aronson Lines 1.11 through 1.14 maybe, I'm having a hard time squaring the responsibility that we've put you know, on your members about being aware of the political process, being engaged in the political process. Well, was that what before I got here? Yes. <laughs> How did I do on the redistricting bill? <laughs> redistricting maps, Mr. Chair. <laughs> can I offer an amendment to your bill when I don't have one? Thank you. Um, <laughs> can I go up to my office now? Representative Dabney, it's free will. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice to know I'm, I'm again here today to provide uh, a little white humor <laughs> to, to levy the day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, no, I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for your response. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Downey and then Breiner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Say, I forgot to put my name on. I'm not sure what the committee protocol is, but I handed out two. Uh, Handouts. One says the big sell, and the other one is titled Election Success Proven Strategies for Public Finance Campaigns. And I really appreciate uh, Representative Bills bringing this uh, bill forward for us. Um, I think it's pretty obvious to everyone that uh, levy referendum uh, campaigns in particular have gotten to be very sophisticated events. And I don't know if you read through these two handouts and, and see anything that implies an inherent conflict of interest or anything that would just uh, innately be a violation of the, the guidelines for district personnel in providing information as compared to lobbying and activism on behalf of a, a levy referendum question. Um, but, you know, when you see the article, uh, the big sell, and it says passing a bond issue means finessing the fine art of salesmanship. And this is the audience, the intended audience here is, is district personnel. Uh, the next one you can read, Election Success, Proven Strategies for Public Finance Campaigns. It's put out by the National School Public Relations Association. And there's a whole toolkit, uh, sample campaign letters, flyers, scripts, PowerPoint presentations, checklists, and much more on vital topics. Research, um, creating strategies, organizing tactics and materials, setting timelines and deadlines, all for the people who are supposed to provide objective information to the public so they can make an intelligent decision. And again, I, I don't mean to imply that any of these materials or these articles, uh, you know, cross the line, the technical line. I don't know if they do or don't. But pretty clearly, um, passing these levy referendum questions bec has become a very sophisticated operation, fine-tuned, well-funded, et cetera. And I think all of us have seen how that's played out uh, in our districts. We've seen how election campaigns and uh, collective bargaining has, you know, turned into teachers wearing uh, T-shirts and putting up signs and, you know, all kinds of things in the classroom. I, I just think this is an important bill. And if the, if the school districts and the, and the school personnel maybe didn't have a vested interest and, and perhaps a little bit of built-in bias on so many of this, we, we wouldn't need representative bills uh, proposal here and, and we could stay out of it and not force this mandate. But I think they have self-interest and have it demonstrated over a period of time now that these things have become really sophisticated, big operations, and we would do well just to make sure that it doesn't cross the line into the classroom and, and uh, violate the uh, clear delineation that we're supposed to have between school re resources and school people and pretty much just staying out of it. So thanks, Representative Bills. Representative Reinhardt, then Greiling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was here when Representative Bills did the amendment, but if I had a little bit more time to have read and thought about it, I would have asked a question then. So I'd like to ask now, Representative Bills, when you eliminated lines 1.11 and 1.12, what was your intention? Representative Bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Bryan. My, my intention is to, to try to create a, a compromise between, you know, you obviously see people like Mr. Kishlishan and I, I know of others in my district and, and believe it or not even teachers who feel the same way uh, to one extreme and then you, you see uh, Ms. Allsweiger and, and Education Minnesota and they seem to be quite a ways apart. What I'm trying to do is find some type of compromise where we can at least begin. I think it's a good message to send to districts that this has worked in Lakeville 
and uh, give it, giving it some time, it, it can work in, in, dis in other districts as well. Representative Briner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I'm, I'm taking that to mean to, that you would see that there's a legitimate role for uh, school boards advocating uh, to the legislature and um, to Congress on particular issues or citizens advocating to their school board or, or teachers uh, or employees advocating to the legislature, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Breinert. Um, not, not getting into to my personal opinions on, on this matter, um, I think it would be valuable to, to uh, attempt to move forward in a way that would let the teachers teach and the students learn and the lobbyists lobby and, and see if we can move forward in that direction. Representative Breiner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, the heart of my matter of, the, of my question goes to 1.14, the line that is remaining after you've taken out the third point. And my concern is that, in effect, um, the remaining language really doesn't, uh, it really, um, you really aren't restoring any uh, advocacy potential because there's this phrase, advocate for any other political issue. And without uh, the third point there, what becomes the definition of other? Representative Bills. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chairman and Representative Breiner, uh, Representative Breiner, I did eliminate 1.1. Four as well. Oh, you did. Yes, I did. Okay. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Representative Greiling and then Mary Ann. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Breiner. I thought. Oh, that's all right. I, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, um, that does make a big difference because um, I would interpret that to mean that you, that you would see an appropriate role for advocacy, but maybe you're not saying that. You're just trying to reach a compromise. But I do. I wanted also to add to the discussion. Um, because uh, th there was a parent come from Roseville talking about their legislative uh, action committee. Mankato has had a legislative committee for over 20 years. Um, they, I have never seen advocacy as expressed in this email. We never send things out um, to our parents, et cetera, but we do, uh, the school district has uh, annually created a legislative platform that advocates for issues of concern that are based on what the, that committee sees as its professional responsibility to convey to legislators what is actually happening in a school district, what is the actual consequence of certain positions, you know, um, what, what are the district's responsibilities to special ed, et cetera. So it's an, an education arm uh, that's meant to inform legislators. Uh, do you see your bill as eliminating that uh, type of activity? Mr. Chair and Representative Brenner, no, I don't, because the school board is uh, is an agent unto itself and not contracted unless, a, uh, you know, that's the way I see it. I don't want to go into hypotheticals because there's just too many of them. Representative Brenner, was that it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Greiling and then Mary Ellie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First, I think for committee members, if there's any other late coming Democrats or Republicans, but I guess it's the Democrats, what we deleted in this delete all amendment DE2 is 1.11, 1.12, and 1.14. So hopefully nobody else will get caught up in that. But that's why, Mr. Chair, I asked to have it repeated and why, you know, I think especially the Democrats are slow getting here sometimes. We, uh, so we have to really go slower. We can't catch on to what we're talking about here. You need to give us, cut us some slack. Senator Greiling, you know the mics are on, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so I just want to uh, say two things. Uh, one, um, regarding as Mr. Kisselishan's testimony and regarding the um, handout the Roseville Area Schools, I notice you've highlighted and are thinking that, I think your highlights are to show that this is partisan, that they're picking on the governor and telling all the members, uh, people in Roseville Area Schools territory to call the Republicans. And you've highlighted that all of them on the conference committee are Republicans and so forth. And I know you're very political, so I know you know, but just in case there's anyone that is looking at this handout that doesn't know, um, Usually there are Democrats, Mr. Kisselishan, on the conference committee. Last year was the first year uh, 
I think ever, but certainly since I've been here, that it was all Republicans. So it might look like it's picking on Republicans, but that's because Republicans were picking on the Democrats and didn't put any on the conference committee. Um, and also I think it's because um, they were looking at issues and they were with the governor. He was actually advocating for more money for schools, whereas the Republican bill was cutting education. Luckily he won and we got the $50 per pupil. But what might look partisan if you don't look into it um, is actually issue oriented. But my comments then for this committee are, and I could have taken that up with Mr. Kisselish and back in Roseville, but I thought it applied to the whole hearing here. Um, I thank you for the um, changes that you've made. Um, and I could see where Mr. Kisselishan or even Representative Kwam, um, they're not getting their issues addressed as the bill now stands. <clears throat> but from my perspective, that is a good thing. You know, I come from the League of Women Voters, and that was my political cutting my teeth uh, in my life before I came here. And it's always a constant battle to get people to be involved and to get them to pay any attention to government and what's going on here. And you, it's a rare individual that will actually receive something like this action alert from the Roseville Legislative Action Committee or get something from Education Minnesota or whatever group they belong to to actually read it, be motivated by it, and then to actually act. You know, that's a very hard thing to do. And your bill, as it originally stood, would have gotten in the way of citizen involvement that we get so little of. You know, if I, if I hear from three people in my district, I think, wow, that's a big issue. And if I hear from 10, I'm, you know, that's a, something that really has a lot of steam. And so I think we need more of that and not less. And I'm glad you recognize that and took those parts out of your bill, and I appreciate that. What is um, left? I have a question. Um, I think it, it, the school boards can figure this out, and, and they've testified they don't have a problem with the bill. But um, on line 1.10, you've got advocate the passage or defeat of any referendum question. That's what they cannot do. But then on um, 1.18, um, they are allowed and they, you know, are, shall not be prohibited here from doing, providing factual information on, um, on the levy referendum. And that's what they do right now. And I think that I'm glad you left that in there. Um, but I just hope you don't take anybody's suggestion to make a penalty if they do um, uh, one and not the other, because I think it's a fine line between what's a factual information and what's um, advocating for something or against something. Um, sometimes when you prevent, present the facts, it looks like the facts speak so clearly for, for themselves that you are advocating for something or against it. So I, I just... Um, I hope as we go forward that you don't add any penalty in because I think we could be hung up with paying lawyers with school money if we do that because I think the, it could be in the eye of the beholder if they are advocating for a referendum versus um, providing factual information. So I thank you for how you ended up with your bill. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mariani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would uh, echo Representative Grayling's um, wise um, thoughts here. I think there is a fine line between, um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our public agencies engaging uh, citizens in such a way that we encourage them to, to be involved. And obviously, you know, we exist in a, in a, in a partisan world, and um, I think we often throw that word around a little carelessly. I, I, I don't think partisanship is necessarily an evil thing. It, it, it often means that there's more than one opinion. Uh, there's more than one interpretation of something. I think what makes us a, a particularly strong society is that there is more than one opinion and we have a clash of ideas and we uh, engage in those uh, fully. So we don't want to put the kibosh on that. Um, I just want to, this is almost a, a, a more minute point for Representative Bills, but on line point, 1.13, and I'm really glad Representative Dabney went before me because I would have, <laughs> I was about to go right into that same hole, uh, Representative Dabney. Uh, we, we often race each other to see who's going to be the last one to committees. And, um, 
Uh, but um, You're just beating up on yourself. Yeah, we are. Today, you know, <laughs> it's it's that Catholic Lutheran guilt thing. You know? <laughs> Uh, Democrat punctuality disorder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Mariani. EPD. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Representative Bill is a 1.13. I think the, the emphasis of the language, solicit funds for political purposes, uh, there's two, two things here. One is the whole notion of soliciting funds, and then uh, there's political purpose. And um, it seems to me that um, this language uh, could be tighter. Um, I think that um, political purpose, um, you know, could mean a lot of things for a lot of folks. And um, I know that, uh, um, so here's my cheap shot for the day. I know that uh, former Pennsylvania senator uh, yesterday uh, identified global climate change as not a, a science-based uh, issue, but a political-based uh, issue. And it would seem to me then that if that, that's a reinterpretation of what that is, then, you know, any soliciting of funds for, for perhaps ecological, you know, after school activities might be interpreted as politically, uh, for political purposes. Um, I, I don't mean to do a cheap shot. I just really uh, offer that by way of encouraging you to, to tighten that language up. In, in line 1. Point, or 1. 1.9 and 1.10, you're very explicit about what you're talking about in terms of political purposes and perhaps a, a, a better way, because I do think the soliciting funds for things that, you're, that we were agreeing shouldn't happen, um, that their language should be there, and perhaps your language on 1.13 might want to reference uh, the 1. Uh, 1.9 and 1.10, uh, soliciting funds for purposes identified in one or two. So I'm offering that as a suggestion to sort of avoid you know, some mischief uh, down the line with this language. Any other comments from members of the committee? Representative Bills, any closing comments? No, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and once again, I, I think uh, that you can see that there are people on on both sides of this issue who are who are uh, who are quite a ways apart. And and I hope that this can go. I know hope's not a, not a great strategy, but I, I hope that this can be put through in a way that we can start working towards what, what Lakeville has done and, and in a way where our, our schools are not being used as, as uh, in political leveraging. And I guess I'll take off my, my legislator hat for a second, which I, which I do usually, and uh, put on my hat that I wore from 7.30 to 8.20 this morning, which is a teacher. So I get to be in the school every day. So it's, uh, not to rip on anybody here, but it's usually the highlight of my day, being, being with those young people. They're much easier to deal with. No, I'm just kidding. They're 17, 18 year olds and they're great. But, but it's just, we would like as teachers, I believe, to do our job. And when politics enters into the school building in some of, in some of the ways that I, and I have, I have lots of data and, and examples um, that, that I was prepared to use, but I won't. But, but when we're seeing meetings for political purposes taking place during my contract time between 7 and 3 o'clock, and that's the time that I'm supposed to be working with kids, that I have a real problem with that. And not just me, but there are other teachers who do as well, and there are other parents. So that's to the extreme, and, and, I, and I, hope that, I hope that this language, and, and as amended, this can go forward and send a clear message to please let just let teachers teach. And that would be my summation, Mr. Chairman. The closing comments, Representative Bills. With that, Representative Bills renews his motion to have House File 329 as amended be recommended to pass and refer to the General Register. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. no. Motion prevails. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Representative Bills. The third and final item on our committee agenda today is House File 2244, the O'Driscoll Bill. The chair will move House File 2244 be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Education no, Environment, fi Environment Finance. Okay. And Representative Odrisco, my understanding is the A1 amendment is an author's amendment? That is correct. Okay, so the, sure. chair, the chair will move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form that the author would like. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative O'Driscoll to your bill as amended. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this is not a new concept that is before legislative committees here today. Uh, this bill has been in the works for a number of years here at the legislature, carried in a bipartisan manner by uh, most recently uh, Representative Dietrich and uh, Representative Downey have uh, been very actively involved in this. In the way of a little bit of a, ba a background, you'll recall that last week we were visited by some representatives from the state of Utah who were here to share with us the successes that they had in their state over the last 16 years when they endeavored to remove their trust, uh, their student trust lands from under the supervision of the Department of Natural Resources, establish and create a separate entity that could assume the fiduciary responsibilities without having to worry about managing conflict of interest between the student land trust properties and other properties that were owned by the state of Utah that would otherwise be in, uh, under the charge of the Department of Natural Resources. I know this committee had the opportunity to hear from them and to do some Q&A, so I'll dispense with the, the comments uh, and reactions from their testimony. As we dig further into this, the reason why this is such an important issue before us today is that under the Constitution of the state of Minnesota, when we were granted statehood, the federal government required that we set aside two sections of land, which is one mile by one mile in, in size, to be used for the benefit of the school children here in the state of Minnesota. And the legislature has a fiduciary obligation to manage those lands in the best interests of the students in the state of Minnesota. And if you're familiar at all with law, or even if you aren't, fiduciary simply means this, that you owe a higher level or duty than you would in a normal business transaction. In other words, you have to advocate fully, wholly, and exclusively on behalf of the party that you've been put in charge with. Those are our constitutional charges under the land trust. What we've been doing over the last number of years by asking the DNR and the state of Minnesota to manage these properties on behalf of the school children is we have put them at a severe disadvantage and asking them to compromise what a fiduciary would do. What this bill does, as amended, will establish a separate legislative oversight committee and commission that will be responsible for hiring, appointing an executive director, as well as putting staff in place who can designate and dedicate their time fully, fully and exclusively to advocating on behalf of the school children for those trust lands. One of the things that's interesting to note is that if we close books on December 31st and open books on, Jan on January 1st of the following year when this legislation goes into effect, nothing changes as far as the requirements to be able to process this land, to appraise this land, to extract minerals from this land, to be able to do uh, uh, clearing of timber on this land. All rules, all statutes stay in place. What ends up happening is very simply this. We put a separate commission in place to assume the fiduciary responsibilities to wholly solely advocate on behalf of school children here in the state of Minnesota and remove the conflict of interest that currently exists or placing the DNR at a disadvantage. The amendment that I've offered today I think is important to take a look at because it establishes a legislative committee versus a citizen slash legislative committee. And the structure that I'm advocating for in the, in the legislative committee says that there are two chambers, the House and the Senate, and there's traditionally two political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. Each body would be responsible for bringing three Republicans and three Democrats in the House and the Senate for a total of 12 members. There would never, based on political uh, uh, balance in the legislature or in the governor's office, be put into play or in the mix as to who would have any kind of advantage, Republicans or Democrats, House or Senate in this. What it does is it takes the politics out of it and it says that six legislators who are Democrats, three from the House, three from the Senate, and three legislators who are Republican, three from the House, three from the Senate, would get together and advocate as the oversight committee, the commission, on behalf of the students in the state of Minnesota. Mr. Chair, with that, I'll take questions if the committee has them. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Do you have any additional testifiers that you have as part of your presentation? Mr. Chair, thank you. I'd like to invite Grace Kelleher from the Minnesota School Board Association to, uh, to join me as, and uh, offer some comments as well. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Kelleher. Please state your name for the record. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Grace Kelleher, and uh, I'm here today to support. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I think I got the same coffee that Representative Daphne had this morning. <laughs> We all know Representative Daphne was not drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he was this morning at committee when he made the similar kind of mistakes. 
Ms. Keller, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to just start off and let you know how much respect and honor I have for Representative O'Driscoll for taking on this issue with both hands and ready to dig in and figure out how to help the school trust plans uh, fulfill their fiduciary duty. And I want to thank Representative Dietrich. I'd like to think of her as the godmother of the trust plan. Uh, Chairman Garofalo, uh, Representative Erickson, and Representative Greiling, who have through the years always been there seeing how we can better manage these lands. This bill comes out of need. Uh, in the school trust lands, we've seen management fees at the DNR rise over 300% since 2004, and administrative costs have gone up 100% since that day. There are, there are big change in the wind, and it's a good time to make sure we are following our constitutional dedication. Presently, there is about 710,000 acres of our trust lands that are restricted or not producing revenue. And that's an issue that's just got to change. Uh, the BWCA trade uh, that's in the wind would offer 32,000 additional acres of school trust fund land and $100 million in our trust fund account that could be dedicated to technology across the state, as we've heard before, or uh, additional teachers in the classroom. Last, I encourage you to support the bill because this is about our founding fathers. A little bit about who we are, why you work so hard, why you're sitting here today. Our Enabling Act had this legislation in it. Our forefathers realized that democracy was based on an educated populace. This bill and their dedication, you need to take it to the next step and make sure that school trust lands don't become the credit card for the DNR and that, in fact, we can uncommingle the funds and give clear accounting to it and clear FTEs that we're fulfilling our purpose in the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll pause there and answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, do you have any additional testifiers at this, for your presentation? Mr. Chair, at this time I have no additional testifiers. There may be others who want to testify and it would be available for comments at that time. And Ms. Kelleher, what we'll do is we'll conclude, make sure everyone gets a chance to offer public testimony and then we'll come back to uh, questions from members of the committee. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. This is it. Uh, Wayne Brandt from the Minnesota Timber Producers Association and Forestry Industries. Do you sign up to testify? Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Wayne Brandt, uh, I'm Executive Vice President for uh, Minnesota Timber Producers, Minnesota Forest Industries. I thought maybe we'd hear from the uh, department. Uh, so I'll be uh, kind of amending a little here on the, uh, on the uh, fly. Uh, Minnesota Forest Industries members are uh, paper mills, engineered wood products manufacturers, sawmills, wood-based bioenergy producers and uh, utility poles and uh, landowners. So pretty much soup to nuts on uh, the primary manufacturing side. Minnesota Timber Producers Association members are uh, loggers, uh, small sawmills, truckers, and allied businesses from uh, throughout the state. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank and uh, commend the committee for uh, this hearing, the bill's author, uh, as uh, Mrs. Kelleher, Ms. Kelleher said, uh, commend uh, Representative Dietrich, who's uh, uh, given so much light to this issue. Representative McFarlane is the chair of the Permanent School Trust Fund uh, Advisory Committee that's been working diligently. Representative Downey also uh, serves on that. Uh, to thank them for uh, educating folks in the legislature and outside of the legislature, informing uh, folks about this issue and uh, and bringing a lot of light to this issue. I'd like to particularly thank Representative Dietrich, who uh, took the time uh, last fall to come to uh, Duluth, actually Proctor, uh, to uh, speak to my uh, Timber Producers Association uh, Board of uh, Directors. She made, as uh, many of you have heard uh, a number of times, her uh, passionate presentation on these uh, on these issues uh, we had uh, substantial uh, discussion uh, about that uh, after her uh, visit but everyone was uh, was very uh, impressed in fact uh, it is uh, one of the issues that's been on the radar screens of uh, certainly both of my organizations for <clears throat> many many years I can recall uh, testifying 
Uh, I have been in this position a while, testifying uh, back in the uh, mid-90s. I forget if it was a conference committee uh, or uh, what the committee was on uh, permanent school trust fund issues and, uh, and the issue of uh, allocating fire suppression costs to the, uh, against the revenues in the trust fund, which uh, is one of the great uh, unfairnesses that has uh, continued for uh, many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, it's never been uh, resolved by the legislature to uh, appropriate general fund dollars to uh, correct that, uh, that uh, injustice of uh, charging uh, the school trust fund lands for those costs. You know, the uh, permanent school trust fund is the only category of land in our state that gets charged for fire suppression costs. We don't charge wildlife management areas. We don't charge parks. We don't charge counties. We don't charge private landowners. We don't try charge tribal ownership. We don't charge anybody for fire suppression except for uh, the the children of our state, in essence, uh, through the uh, permanent school trust fund. But that's not the DNR's deal. I mean, that's how the money gets appropriated from uh, the appropriating committees, not education finance, but the environment uh, finance committees. And unfortunately, when uh, adjustments were made to that 10 or 15 years ago, uh, they didn't uh, correct that anomaly and budgets. Well, it hasn't, it's never been fixed. Uh, I'll just uh, leave it uh, at that. Uh, you know, we have uh, <clears throat> several uh, substantive uh, concerns <clears throat> about the bill and some parts uh, that we like. Bottom line, uh, folks want more revenues into the school trust fund. Uh, we do too. Uh, we provide or we pay uh, about $10 million a year for the uh, trees that we harvest on uh, school trust fund lands. Uh, we would like to uh, harvest more trees on school trust, school trust fund lands. Uh, one of my members uh, in particular uh, imports uh, something more than 20% of the wood that they process uh, from Wisconsin. <coughs> Pardon me, they are one of the largest uh, uh, producers and consumers uh, here in the state. They would just soon buy their wood in Minnesota as opposed to uh, bringing it in from Wisconsin. We would like uh, higher quality wood. Uh, we'd like uh, to uh, harvest uh, wood that's uh, at its economic rotation age, uh, which we think would provide benefits to the trust. It would uh, also provide benefits to us. Uh, better stock stands that are healthier uh, are worth more money. Wood is all sold at auction, uh, and it, wood of that type uh, brings a, uh, a higher price. A 40-year-old aspen stand will typically have uh, 30 courts to the acre or more in our state. Uh, if it's not harvested until it's 60, that will drop off uh, down to 20 or, uh, or into the teens as it uh, goes further uh, on to uh, becoming uh, stagnant. Uh, if you harvest that aspen stand twice in 80 years, uh, you're going to get uh, a lot more cords than if you harvest it once in, uh, in 60 or uh, 70 years. So we think that there are a number of things uh, that uh, can be uh, done. We think that establishing a position of a trust fund advisor, advocate, adver uh, oversight position, uh, however it might be constructed, is good. Uh, we think that as uh, Representative uh, O'Driscoll uh, proposes that uh, having that position uh, placed in uh, the Department of Administration uh, seems to make uh, sense uh, to us. Uh, we think that the underlying statutes uh, directing uh, how permanent school trust fund lands are to be managed are going to need some work. Uh, we think that uh, uh, it would be preferable to resolve some of these issues through fixing the underlying statutes uh, rather than creating a new agency of government, uh, which we don't support. Uh, we're not uh, in favor of that. We would be uh, happy to work on the underlying statutes that provide direction to the department uh, and are uh, very uh, open and willing to do that. You know, there's currently 17 public agencies in the state of Minnesota that manage for public forest land. You've got the DNR, you've got with their, with their green trucks, you've got different shade green trucks for the two national forests, the Superior National Forest and the Chippewa National Forest. You've got 14 counties, they've got blue trucks, they've got white trucks, they've got gray trucks, they've got tan trucks, they're managing uh, timberlands uh, too. And we're not convinced that another set of uh, different colored trucks uh, is, uh, is the answer. Uh, we know there are others that have a different opinion, arrived at a different conclusion, but that's, uh, that's our view on this matter. 
And I would just go back to, uh, again, you know, thanking Representative Dietrich for her presentation at uh, my logging association board meeting. You know, one of, uh, one of my directors, uh, as we uh, were discussing this and other legislative issues, that afternoon said, gee, why don't they just tell the DNR to do it differently instead of setting up a whole new agency? So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the commissioner wants to testify. Is that correct? Come on down. Uh, Representative Dietrich, we're going to be taking <coughs> questions. But we'll make sure everybody gets a chance to offer their opinions. Yeah, Representative Chairman, Dietrich? It is a clarification at this point. Can I just make it until we go further? Well, we can make a clarification once all people have publicly testified, Representative Dietrich. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Tom Landwehr. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, and I appreciate your having me here today to, to testify. Um, I think this is a great discussion. This is a wonderful thing to be talking about. This is an important asset for the state of Minnesota, and uh, we need to keep it uh, always in our, in our uh, foremind. Having said that, I would like to advise you I would respectfully oppose this bill, and the reason I do is because I am one of the trustees of the state trust fund. I'm the, as a commissioner, I'm the trustee of the state lands, and uh, as the fiduciary, it's my obligation to oppose any actions that I believe will detract from the trust fund revenues, and I seriously believe this will detract from the trust fund revenues. Uh, in my uh, opinion, that's the outcome. We're always looking for improvements, and I welcome the opportunity to uh, hear about what's going on in Utah and hear about uh, issues that people may have so we might improve our management of the trust land. But in my opinion, there are several major uh, issues with this bill. One, and to uh, Mr. Brandt's point, I'm not convinced that expanding government is a way to get increased uh, efficiencies out of, uh, out of uh, state assets. I think that this, uh, in fact, uh, makes for very many inefficiencies uh, to the point Mr. Brandt made, having different colored trucks driving by each other to manage adjacent lands in virtually identical ways does not make any sense to me. Um, I think it uh, frankly crosses the line of separation of powers. Even with the amendment uh, today, this would put the uh, management of state assets under the legislative branch. Uh, which, of course, is uh, not what the Constitution spells out. The Constitution spells out that the legislature shall leg uh, authorize and appropriate, the executive branch shall execute. Uh, this puts those uh, asset management responsibilities into the legislative branch, which uh, clearly violates the separation of powers. And thirdly, although this is something that might be easily amenable, this actually deprives the local units of government of about $2 million of uh, revenue. Currently, the uh, statutes require that uh, all lands managed by the Department of Natural Resources shall pay a payment in lieu of taxes uh, uh, payment to counties for lost revenue. This, by virtue of creating a separate agency, does not uh, allow for the payment of those $2 million worth of taxes. Uh, if, in fact, the, uh, the challenge here is to get over some of the conflicts between the department's responsibilities as a conservation entity and as a trust manager, we must realize, to Mr. Brandt's point, that some of those conflicts are legislative in their creation. Uh, the statutes that guide the department to manage lands say that these lands shall be managed consistent with sound natural resource policies, and that's often held up as the thing that is a challenge for uh, the department to overcome, but I'd offer that there are several other statutory uh, issues as well, and Mr. Brandt touched on them, but for example, it is uh, a requirement of uh, the statute that before we can sell any lakeshore that we must get legislative approval. So we are operating here with uh, sort of one arm tied behind our back and uh, uh, a mandate to go faster and faster. Uh, we're always looking for thing, ways to improve our operation. We've got several things in the hopper right now that I believe will do that. Uh, things that will uh, transcend the, uh, this administration and move us into the next administration. I, I welcome the opportunity to hear additional ideas. The Permanent School Fund Advisory Committee, as you know, was intended to offer those. And uh, uh, we look to them for, for suggestions, and I think we are uh, uh, happy to always be looking for continuous improvement. So, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, with that, I'm not going to expand more. I'd be happy to answer any questions because I'm sure there are a lot of questions about what the department does. 
Thank you, Commissioner. I'll just ask if you please stick around so we can conclude. Would you like me to stay here, Mr. Chairman? Or I'll, I'll just stay in the room so that members do have questions before they call upon you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We appreciate your attendance. Are there ad any additional comments, uh, any members of the public who <coughs> testify in favor or voice concerns about the bill? Uh, Craig Pigel? And if uh, you have not, that's the last testifier we have who signed up in advance. If you, any other members of the public wish to testify, please uh, come down and uh, get in line. Welcome to the committee, sir. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair. I'm Craig Pagel. I'm the president of the Iron Mining Association of Minnesota. Um, I'm here today to um, first tell you a little bit about the iron mining industry in northern Minnesota. As the representative Van Zels knows, uh, we do make up about 34% of the gross regional product of northeastern Minnesota. It's a very large industry, much like the agricultural industry um, here in southern Minnesota. Uh, I think what I would first like to say is that the mining industry supports education, not just in the money we pay in royalties, which, if I'm not mistaken, in 2012, based on 2011 mining efforts on trust lands, um, will be about $34 million. Basically, two companies are paying those $34 million. Um, we also support it in production taxes. It's, um, production taxes are in lieu of property taxes. That's about $17 million that goes to local schools. So $51 million, basically, two companies will be paying. And we thank you for the, the ability to use those minerals and those mineral rights. Um, we also support education, though, not just in money. One of our uh, general managers, one of the gentlemen that runs the mines, is a superintendent, not a superintendent, excuse me. He is the president of the board of the local um, Hibbing School District. And many of the people that are in the area work in the local schools, volunteering their time as well. But our concern with this bill, and the DE one helps a lot in, in a lot of ways, um, we still have a concern that it's an expansion of government to an industry that, um, quite frankly, we've been trying to streamline a little bit more. What would happen by this is we would have one more entity that we'd be negotiating royalties with. And this bill doesn't spell out how any of that's supposed to take place. I don't see any director in that. Even if there were, I think we'd still oppose it in that. Um, while the question seems to be that the DNR is not doing a good job, and you're not quite sure where the money goes, what I can tell you is my bosses, the mine managers, would tell you the DNR is doing too good a job on royalties. First off, when we mine something, any of the overburden is placed in an area where they know where everything is. Low-grade minerals are placed in another area so that if, as an example, scram mining that's just starting up in northeastern Minnesota um, that can actually mine some of the lower-grade ores, they know where they are. It's all taken care of through GPS um, and mapping that's going on with that. It's very highly technical, um, much different than, you know, 40 years ago. <laughs> but what my bosses would say, we've gone from um, 20 to 2002, we were paying about $1.10 on an average for royalties per ton. We now are paying $3.31 a ton. I don't think any other industry in the state has had any fees go up that much. Um, our concern is if we have another entity we're dealing with, rather than a coordinated effort that's done by the DNR, not just on royalties, but on our mining patterns, where we're mining and where it's going, I have a feeling that we're just going to add one more layer of confusion rather than working out maybe the real concerns that legislators have and the school districts have. So on that point, I guess I would say that we oppose this, though I know there's been a lot of hard work done on it. I think there's some other things that can be done other than uh, this bill. Can I say that respectfully? Thank you. Uh, are there any other additional members of the public who wish to testify in favor or voice concerns about the bill? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll close the public comment portion of our bill. We'll move to member questions. And to those who had previously testified, please uh, try to be available for questions if members do have a question for you. Uh, Representative Dietrich, thank you for your patience. Uh, yes, I just wanted to clarify when Mr. Brandt was up, he uh, said that this creates another agency, and it does not. Uh, he has this confused with uh, a previous bill. This, uh, the school trust lands director would be 
housed in the Department of Administration. So it does not create, it does not expand the government, it does not create a new agency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to say that before people kept saying that. No problem. Thank you, Representative Beatrix. Representative Anzels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I find myself in kind of an odd uh, situation here. Um, and I, uh, while I appreciate um, all of your interest in um, the exploitation of northern Minnesota's great resources, um, I've, I've, after a lot of struggle with this, I've, I've concluded that this is really wrong. This is not a good idea. Um, we all want to generate more public revenue off public lands for public purposes, whether they be for educating school kids or other public purposes. I find it somewhat disingenuous, however, that uh, many of my colleagues in this uh, legislature and in this um, world we're living in, um, when people from northern Minnesota um, uh, ask you to allow for um, expedited um, production and expedited harvesting and expedited use of these resources, I, I, I see, I get kind of a mixed reaction. So that's my first point. Um, in order to generate more resources for kids or any other public purpose, you have to let us in northern Minnesota develop our resources. Um, our resources are uh, wonderful to uh, enjoy and to look at and to recreate in, but um, they also are resources that need to be developed. Secondly, it's my uh, belief that um, the budget cutting uh, period of the last 20 years is now starting to show its failed um, outcomes. Um, you can't starve public agencies. You can't um, uh, expect uh, public workers doing public providing public services to provide those services without appropriations from the legislature. Um, we have starved uh, the, the, the public agency that is targeted here, the Department of Natural Resources. And, and yet we've expected them to manage those public resources, especially those resources involving forestry and minerals. It doesn't work. Um, they have had to backfill and support the services that this legislature has required them to provide um, with um, <coughs> appropriations and funds and things that probably uh, should not have uh, been allowed. Um, I would just, uh, lastly, I'll thank you for your uh, indulgence, Mr. Chair, but, you know, um, we've got two and a half million acres of land uh, that were, uh, that's in question here. Uh, three counties um, provide uh, or hold almost 70 percent of those lands, and I have not heard from one school superintendent one school board member, one teacher, one county land manager, one mayor, one county commissioner. I haven't heard from anybody in those three counties that this is something that this legislature needs to do. 
They all would agree if you ask them, however, that we need to maximize for public purposes the resources on school trust fund lands. But to create another entity and uh, uh, do some of the things that this uh, movement uh, suggests, I think, uh, is uh, very premature um, and probably not in the best interests of northeastern Minnesota. And uh, lastly, um, although I chair the delegation from northern Minnesota, my views and what I just said certainly are not uh, shared by them. Those, what I've just said, are my own views, Mr. Chairman. Nice display. Thank you, Representative Van Zels. Uh, Representative Breinart, then Downey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, I'd like to ask about uh, your thinking and uh, moving from a legislative citizen commission to a pure legislative commission. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. The reason for moving from a citizen and legislative committee to a complete legislative committee is those individuals are all on equal footing. They're all elected by the by constituents, part of the legislature, which is charged with the duty of administering the, the trust lands as part of the fiduciary obligation that's um, incumbent upon them as part of the state statute. The second part of it is if you go back and count up the number of people who would be on that commission, it's an odd number. And we could be putting in undesirable politics on that. By this, by this model that I'm advocating right now, again, three Republicans from the House, three Republicans from the Senate, three Republican, or excuse me, Democrats from the House and Democrats from the Senate, you have an even number, there's going to have to be a majority agreement among people because there isn't that odd numbered person to be able to break the tie, if you will, on those kinds of things. And I think that it depoliticizes the process and um, we, uh, you have citizen legislators or I should say citizens in on that. You may not always be drawing from the, the people who have the largest information or base or experience on these types of things, but again, the legislature is, is uh, dedicated by constitution to advocate for these, and that would be another way we would be able to make that happen. Representative Breiner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a series of questions, and I'm trying to think through how best to approach this. Um, first of all, is this model used by any other uh, school trust land um, sta states in managing their, their lands? Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, Representative, that's my knowledge. Representative Breiner. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, the, that exactly goes to one of my concerns, and that I know we only heard from one other state, but when Utah spoke, um, one of the things that moved me to have interest in their model was the type of expertise they brought to the table in terms of balancing um, sort of um, what they talked about as a laser focus. Mm -hmm. um, I have grave concern that legislators by their nature of their office cannot have that laser focus because we're generalists, we're, com we're committed to a wide range of issues. Our, you, yet sitting on the commission um, would be one role and being a legislator would be maybe a competing, conflicting role. So I'm very concerned about conflict of interest and about whether we could get the level of um, return on our school trust lands that was evidenced in Utah if we have a commission made up prim oh, totally of legislators. Did you have a response? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Reinhardt. My reaction to this is twofold. One is, given the fact that the legislature would, would make up the commission, they would also have an executive director and staff and they, that would, they would be able to direct to go out and get those kinds of information on behalf of the, the group, None, not, nothing different than what this committee would have as, a, as a, a power to be able to ask for someone to come in, to be able to bring information, to, to move forward in data collecting. Secondly on that is that this does no way preclude the commission from exploring and bringing in other experts to hear from them or partnering with them for the benefit of the school children. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I, the, I'm still left with a concern about conflict of interest, but I'd also like to ask if uh, you sought any legal advice in shaping this structure. I did not. Con Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. I have not sat down and consulted with the legal counsel on this. 
I'm putting this forward as legislation that I think is um, within the guidelines of what the Constitution says and I'm bringing it through the process. And if you have some concerns about that, I certainly would um, be open to sitting down and visiting for some of the uh, questions or constitutionality if that's what you're, you're raising questions on with conflict of interest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do, I have very serious concerns and I came into this uh, meeting today thinking I would be a strong supporter of this bill, but I can't support the bill without some of these issues being resolved. So at the moment, I, I just, um, I have very serious reservations. Uh, Representative Downey, then Mariani, and then Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I like to try and address a couple of the I'll make a comment and then if uh, uh, the author wants to comment back he can but um, I handed out some materials uh, that are uh, part of the financial picture that has become clear to me now having been on the uh, permanent school fund advisory uh, committee for I guess it's just six or nine months and uh, um, what I want to make clear to people is that the information that I had handed out the lost revenue chart and then the uh, uh, the effects of the increased contributions on the permanent school fund table um, were not produced by the Department of Natural Resources, in fact, to try and extract any uh, financial information, let alone a coherent picture of that financial information, let alone a coherent understanding of how well these assets and investments have performed over even the last 20 or 30 years has been essentially impossible. And so the information that you're looking at before you um, was not able to be produced by our fiduciary. In fact, this was produced by a handful of staff people uh, spending some time doing a bit of research and digging up some information and running it past the State Board of Investment. And even when the Department of Natural Resources came forward and said, oh, gosh, we got to react to this, the legislature is serious this time around, and came back with some kind of a position description so that somebody within the DNR would actually start performing the function of fiduciary, there was not a word in that position description or that order, whatever the operational order, I guess, is what they called it, um, that had anything to do about return on assets, return on investment, um, a, co a coherent uh, fiduciary type uh, um, set of functions that would look at this thing from an investment return standpoint. And so I'm here to tell you that based on my own personal experience sitting in these meetings and trying to extract even the most basic information from the Department of Natural Resources, I'm here to tell you the DNR has not fulfilled its mission as a fiduciary for at least the last 20 or 30 years and that's all the information that, that you can come up with. In 1908, Minnesota had the second largest school trust land value in the country, second highest, 1908. Today we're in the bottom third. We share a fiduciary responsibility as elected officials along with the Department of Natural Resources, and I gotta tell you, we have been failing as well. And thanks to Representative Dietrich and others, and, and frankly the folks uh, uh, up on the range, uh, Representative Rukavina and others who've continued to sound this alarm that we aren't doing our job, uh, we gotta listen and we gotta do something. And and I, I think any kind of graying of the lines or, oh gee, maybe we don't need to move this fast. Well, I'm telling you what, I don't know what we need to do. It was 1908 to 2012 that caused the problem. If we gotta wait that long again to do something because we gotta watch it some more, then we're derelict in our duties too. And, and I gotta speak really strongly on this. This is a huge mistake asking an agency whose fundamental core mission and ethic is land preservation and another kind of environmental stewardship ethic that governs everything they do, to ask them to also be fiduciary manage, managers uh, of an, an asset, uh, a pile of land and, and other types of assets along with an investment fund asset, it's, it's just a mistake and it's nothing bad against them, it's just not who they are. Even in their operational order, very little about how we'd actually manage this thing from a return on investment and a return on assets standpoint. So I'm gonna walk you through these charts because I think you need to see the information that we've had at the advisory committee the last six to nine months. And again, this didn't come from the DNR. This came because we produced it as an advisory committee. Lost revenue, you can see the items that um, you go back and look over the last 20, 30 years. 
opportunities that were missed or uh, expenses that were over allocated to this permanent school fund. Um, you can see that list there. I'll come back to that when we total it up and show you what the State Board of Investment uh, determined from that. You look at uh, total uh, land revenue equalized for acres owned and you see Minnesota compared um, to other states. You go on to the next one and look at the revenue per mineral acre. And I don't know, maybe we went from a buck to three bucks on some kind of royalty charge in the last couple of years. But I'll tell you what, we're not getting the money out of the acreage uh, like we could. And whether that's because we haven't had the production as Representative Anzell said, or maybe that should be 10 times uh, the royalty level that it is today, I couldn't tell you, but neither can anybody in the DNR. And you add all this stuff up and you hand it off to the State Board of Investment and you say, gee, what if we had actually had those revenues over the last 30 years, the ones that we can track, just a handful of ones that became obvious after months of digging on the advisory committee, what would that trust fund look like had we actually managed this a little more aggressively, leveraged those opportunities, not had these overcost allocations? $245 million more in that fund. It's 700 and some million right now. $245 million. This is just what we came up with. And they can't tell you this. So members, I think, you know, we, we can argue about the finer points and gee, did we have lawyers look at this and boy, is this the exact right structure with the, the legislators or should we have something different? But I gotta tell you, we gotta do something different. And we aren't adding any new layers of government. We're simply taking that advisory committee, we're reconstituting it, giving it some real authority and allowing them to hire somebody who thinks like a private sector investment manager to do the job that we should have been doing for the last 30 years, maybe the last 100 years. You go back all the way to the Northwest Ordinance, the land ordinance of whatever it was, 1874 or whatever the year was, and it talks about taking parcel uh, or uh, uh, section 16 out of every township and dedicating it to the schools. This is a 153 year ethic that we've inherited as a, as a legislature and as a people of Minnesota. And you know what, Minnesota doubled down on that and we said we're gonna allocate section 16 and section 36 of every township in the state of Minnesota when it forms and we're gonna use that for revenue for the schools. Two sections out of every township. You know what, if we owned that land today, <laughs> If we hadn't sold it, if we hadn't traded it for swamp land and all this other, who, I'm, and again, I don't mean to bash my ancestors or yours. I mean, I'm sure they were making as best a decision as they could. But if we had that land today, it would be worth over $20 billion. $20 billion. You know, what, what have we been doing? We, we got to deal with this thing right now. And if we can't deal with it legislatively, and if the department's going to fight us tooth and nail uh, on, on every one of these moves that we're proposing to make here in Representative O'Driscoll's bill, then maybe there's some other avenues that we as legislators uh, can pursue to force the state of Minnesota, us included, to actually fulfill our fiduciary responsibilities. The, the time is now, and uh, graying the issue or creating all these little you know subplots as to why we can't do this, uh, we can no longer make excuses. We we got to do this this year. Representative Mariani. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative um, Obrisco, who under under this bill, who manages the land? Who manages the what, Representative Mariani? The trust fund lands. Representative Odrisco. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Mariani. What would happen would be that those lands would be identified uh, from the DNR, be moved over into the commission. The commission, the legislative commission I'm talking about would have the oversight. The day-to-day -day management would be done by the executive director and the staff, and then the, those kinds of things would still have to come back to, to under current law that would have to be approved by the legislature, would have to be approved by the legislature for sale or for other, and all other laws would still have to be followed in the state of Minnesota that would deal with timber or mining and, and the like. So, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Driscoll, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm kind of like we're a uh, number of other members that you know I'm, I'm attracted to this, but I'm also wanting to be really um, responsible here, particularly when we have language um, where you know the director. Um, I'm trying to decipher or interpret for myself. You know what is what does it mean when the director and the Department of Natural Resources can't agree? to certain management frameworks and we have then the ability of the director to move services to another agency or an outside entity. 
And I, I can see some of this is very uh, descriptive. It talks about, you know, payroll services, you know, et cetera. And that seems, you know, okay to me. But, but if any of this implies that someone else is going to be actually managing land, um, then, I, then I, I want us to be real clear about whether or not we're intending that. Uh, and if, if so, who, who would that be? Um, and that might require perhaps a longer conversation than we have time for here. And so, Representative Downey, um, I, 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 I totally dig your, your passion on this. But, you know, lawyers do need to look at this very carefully. We are talking about the lands of the state of Minnesota. And um, um, if there's language here that uh, suggests that, that the physical management of, of land, you know, could wind up somewhere else than DNR, um, I think we need to be clear about that. I don't think that's your intent, uh, Representative Driscoll. Clearly your intent is to make sure that whatever management happens, happens within the guidance and the parameters of state law. Um, and so I guess my, my, let me come back to my, my question, which I know is partly confusing, but I'm trying to work through this. Is there anything in this language that would suggest that anyone other than a state agency would ever manage uh, these public lands? Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, Representative Mariani, yes. And the reason for that is right now what's happening is when these lands are under the management of the DNR, they decide how much is going to be charged against the trust funds for expenses when the revenues come in unchecked. If we were to say, let's move over under this commission, the, the, the administrative responsibilities, but then we don't have a, any way to be able to balance back against the DNR for the charges that they're going to be, be doing this, we shouldn't even have this conversation today. We need to have some checks and balances within this provision that if the management, the commission, the executive director feel that they could re receive some of those uh, consultations, resources, and other things from an outside source, that yes, and perhaps they should have that ability to be able to do that. Otherwise, we're no further ahead than we are today. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Driscoll, I, I appreciate the forthrightness and, and clarity that, that, um, that you're sharing here in, in this regard. I, I, this will need to settle in my brain for quite a while before I, I, I take this kind of jump even though I share with you and Representative Dietrich the ultimate goal here. Um, I do want to say, Mr. Chair, quickly, too, that, you know, Representative Ansels said something I think really needs repeating. Uh, and I served on the Environment Finance Committee 10 years ago, and there aren't too many members around this table who were even in the legislature 10 years ago. And one of the things that we saw happening, and, and, and it's like looking in the mirror and pointing at yourself, is that we, in fact, were severely uh, undermining the appropriations to, to DNR. And, you know, it's, it's a proverbial thing about the balloon. You, you squeeze in on one part, it's going to pop out somewhere else. I am not excusing any of the behavior of DNR. Representative Grayling shared some horror stories uh, last week about uh, both department and legislative decisions where, you know, hey, you know, uh, easy, let's, let's pick this off. But on the other hand, you know, there is that, that, that kind of inevitable, in, inevitability of state laws requiring the department to do things while we're severely uh, cutting appropriations. And then we began to see a huge jack up in licensing fees, all sorts of permitting fees. We heard the testimony earlier by uh, our, nor our friend from the north on minerals where the tonnage uh, fees had, had tripled. There's a reason for that. And the reason isn't just because DNR is evil. The reason is because the money has to come from somewhere. And I guess what I'm suggesting is here, as we move forward in this conversation, we have to acknowledge our own complicity and how we have set up uh, the behavior in this state to take uh, money away from the kids. And so this is a much more complex conversation that requires some political courage on our part to make sure that we have a tax system in the state that uh, pays for the services that we require uh, of DNR so that they don't wind up taking it out of our kids. But my main point, again, uh, really has to do with, uh, you know, uh, my uncertainty about, you know, eventually where um, responsibility for management of, of this land is going, is going to lie. But I appreciate your forthrightness in it. So uh, we've got Representative Ward, Representative Fabian, and then we're going to take action on this bill. So Senator Ward. Senator Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ward, I'm sorry, that was a
That was Freudian, I know that, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, just a couple quick comments, and I know we're running out of time here. Um, Representative Odrisco, I, I, I too um, have concern, as Representative Briner did, about going to it from a legislative citizen committee just to a strictly legislative committee. Uh, so I just wanted to voice that, number one. Um, and I, we don't have to, I don't have to beat it to death here, but, it, but the, when, we, when we take things on, you know, we tend to sometimes, we need to listen to the citizens, period. Beyond that, though, I, I do applaud you and thank you for this. And, um, you know, Representative Anzel and Representative Mariani addressed the fact that, uh, you know, we have a lot of starving kind of situations down here that we have, that we have created, including uh, starving our education system, including starving our kids in the state of Minnesota. And when, you're, and when people are starving, they'll do anything to, um, to survive. And um, so, I, you know, part of it is, is uh, you know, the DNR has, you know, all agencies are, all, you, you know, as we de haven't had a balanced approach in our, in our uh, budgeting here in, in over a decade, uh, we do need to consider that as well. However, we also, um, you know, we also need to uh, make sure that we uh, do what we can to um, finance and fund education in, in the state of Minnesota. And so, Representative Downey, I thank you for this information, and and Representative Drisk and uh, Dietrich and everybody else that we've heard over and over and over. And Commissioner Landwer, I would really—I well, know we don't have time. My question was going to be directly to you, Commissioner. I would really appreciate, um, as we move forward with this, to hear from the DNR how you tend how you propose, how you um, are going to, um, you know, help us with a better return on the investments. What, what is the DNR going to do? I know that you set up a, uh, a, a position for that. So I won't take the time to ask you that question or have you come down, but I'd, I really uh, would appreciate the DNR um, coming forth with some information like this, like we have gotten from the Advisory Council on how are we, what are you going to do, what would your plan to improve the investment for our children, cut back on the administrative costs, cut back on, you know, some of the uh, other um, ways that we have uh, not received uh, the funding through the school trust that, that uh, should be there, quite frankly, in my opinion. So I'll just leave it at that, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, allowing me to ask, ask that. Representative Fabian? Okay. Well, Representative Dietrich, uh, inappropriate. You get the last question or comment from the committee before we move the author for closing comments. Uh, good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I just want to, um, I would like to make some closing comments, but I really feel the need to address but some, some uh, of the issues that have been brought up. And uh, so first of all is uh, when people uh, speak in support of or have questions about uh, the bill be being brought forward, I need to ask you the question, uh, and you think that the current system is working? And I think that we have demonstrated over and over and over again in this committee, and mostly in the Environment Committee, because that's where most of my bills end up and die. And if you have ever noticed that the, these school trust land bills go to the Environment Committee, they don't usually even come into the Education Committee. I could ask Mr. Brandt or Mr. Pickell, what, how many times have they had to testify in the Education Committee? And I bet it's close to, this, to zero. Uh, so, uh, but anyhow, back to um, the account and the DNR, actually. Our trustee, how many times has the DNR been in here reporting to the Education Finance Committee what is the state of the trust? What are they investing in? What is the return on the investment? and open it up for questions. So if you think the current system is working, have at it, continue on. Uh, the, other, the second piece that I want to bring up is that um, the accountability piece. It's related to these bills and the, the uh, status of the trust and that type of thing not even being brought to the Education Finance Committee. But uh, try looking these things up online. If you were a parent, or a teacher, or a, um, a school administrator, or anything, you would be hard-pressed to find any of these numbers in any one cohesive place 
uh, for p somebody to read. I am experienced at it. I went over, I went, tried it again over the weekend, which I've tried many different times because I heard a report that the DNR did in the, the um, Senate, and I thought, well, now I've got to find these numbers online because they said they were online. I can't find them. Uh, and I don't know how any of you can look at Kevin Carter, who is the director, administrator of the Utah School Trust Lands, and see what he, the accountability that he has to the beneficiaries. Not to the lumber industry, not to the mining industry, but to the beneficiaries. And the report that he puts out once a month just to make sure that the beneficiaries understand what is going on with their trust fund in the state of Minnesota. Five years ago, people didn't even know they had a trust fund in the state of Minnesota. And if you think that's a coincidence, go ahead and continue to think that. Um, the other thing that I have to mention is that just be very careful. Those in opposition benefit financially from the school trust lands. And there is really supposed to be only one beneficiary. There is one beneficiary. And that is clear in the Enabling Act, and it is clear in the Constitution. And when you stand up and take that oath of office the first day of session, you are confirming that. It is, the beneficiary is the school children of this state, the school districts of this state. The, there have been some uh, questions brought up about structure. I think there are 13, 14, maybe 15 school trust lands, school that, states that have school trust lands. Every single one of their structures look different. Some of them actually have an elected land commissioner. So um, uh, we have brought bills uh, forward to you for the past five years, and everyone, somebody has something to complain about. It's either expanding government, or it's doing this, or it's doing that, or it's doing that. So I can't support this one, can't support this, can't support that. And this goes across party lines. I've had it on both sides. Uh, so this structure has been vetted with many different people trying to take into consideration their feedback and what will happen, uh, what, what can happen. And um, is it my favorite model? No. <clears throat> my favorite model would be an independent agency um, like the Utah model. But people had suggestions on that, so we took them, and this is what has evolved out of that. And uh, the last thing that I need to say to all of you, uh, did you not hear Representative Greiling at our last advisory, at our last education finance committee? Behind closed doors, people coming asking for school trust land money? I shouldn't even say asking. I'm going to be polite. And then look at who testified here today. That school trust land money that they were asking for was a $3 million minerals account. Um, in, uh, so this, uh, this structure is not my favorite structure either, but you know what? In my opinion, we can't do any worse than what we are doing right now. And you know what? If this model doesn't work, I will be the first one to say, scrap it, go back to the old model, or find a different, modify this model into a better, better model. But all as I will say that right now, I believe that this state and the trustees are in breach of trust. So vote for the status quo, continue on, or vote for something different. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Dietrich. Representative O'Driscoll, any closing comments before we vote? I promise, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'll keep it 60 seconds or less. Thank you for having the opportunity to uh, get this process started again. This is the first stop on this bill. I have not been around here for an awful long time, but what I have learned is that no bill comes to a committee perfectly right the first time and it heads to the floor. There are many committees, there are many things that we need to take into consideration. I remain open to doing that and what I have to ask you is when you consider your vote today, do you believe that the current model, current structure is the right structure? If you believe that something better could happen, this is your vehicle this session to be able to get something better to happen. And so a yes vote today would be greatly appreciated on behalf of the school children in the state of Minnesota. I acknowledge it's not perfect. We have some things that we need to do. But if we don't, if we don't get strong support today as we continue forward, we're going to be back here again next session 
another whole year is going to go by, and we're going to be asking ourselves, what have we done for the kids? Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. With that, the Chair renews his motion to have House File 2244 be recommended to pass as amended and referred to the Environment Finance Committee. Uh, members, do not get up and leave at the end of this vote. We're not done yet. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The motion prevails. House File 2244 is passed as, rec as amended and referred to the Environment Finance Committee. Representative O'Driscoll, thank you. And we even passed your bill, even though you forgot to bring treats to the committee for your first visit here. <laughs>